Let's let's just jump right in. So I wanted to start with the burning question. Oh boy! <laughs> Is your name even Fred Brito? Is that even your real name? Yep, I was born, raised Frederick Brito. No middle name. Hmm, that's interesting. Throughout his criminal career, Fred Brito assumed dozens of identities, all with phony names and resumes. He fooled everyone from city mayors, state senators, the Red Cross, even the Catholic Church. It's reported that Fred Brito faked his way through God knows how many jobs. He's worked as a high-profile fundraiser for a prestigious medical school, a court-appointed psychiatrist, even a priest. And it was all based on lies. You've had so many jobs. Like, have you ever counted them? How many jobs you've had? Um, I could probably say I've had more than forty-five well-established positions. Could you list some of the names that you've used? All right, I got them here in front of me. I've kept all my IDs from all these different jobs I've had. I have Gomez and Maria's, which is which my name is now. Let's see. I got I got Fred Brito Gomez is another one. Reverend Fred Esparza, Washington Theological Union, Frederick Gomez, and then I was the uh, director of major gifts at Orthopedic Hospital Los Angeles, and it was Federico De Brito, and it's spelled F E D E R I Q K O E. And believe me when I say that these are just a few of Fred Brito's pseudonyms. Then I was at Loyola Law School, so I had a uh, my name there was Fred De Brito. We don't have time to list them all. Fred Brito is a self-proclaimed con man, and he doesn't shy away from his criminal record either. I've had let's count it. I've had grand theft twice, uh, fraud twice. Illegal use of a credit card twice. So I'm looking at probably six official convictions. I, I interview a lot of con artists, right? And and the I would say the majority of them don't consider themselves con artists. Do you consider yourself a con artist? Well, yes. In a in a, I guess if you reveal what the or define the word con artist, I guess I guess. Um, I would qualify for that. So I, I would say yes. And do you take any pride or joy in being considered a con artist? Or is it something that, that brings you shame? No, it actually brings me shame. But here's the deal. I never really thought I'd get in. The deal is that Fred Brito is just too modest to admit what he really thinks of himself. He wants you to believe he is a brilliant mastermind. And he's got the press to support that claim. He's played more characters than De Niro. Good evening and welcome to Dateline. I'm Stone Phillips. And I'm Ann Curry. Talk about it. In fact, Dateline NBC called Brito the ultimate con artist. And you'll be surprised at who fell for his tricks. But is he really? In today's episode, we're going to try to untangle some of Fred Brito's many lies. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. So is Fred Brito still conning people today? Nope. Nope. <laughs> but 
Legally, I've never been convicted of a crime since 2002. So I'm on my 20th year of no jail, no prison, no, no nothing. Now, does it mean that I have been innocent? Uh, well, every time I get a job, I guess I've had to fub the truth just to get a job. So I guess I'm not that innocent. So how did he do it? How did Fred Brito manage to fool so many of his employers? To understand the how, we first have to start with the why. I never really thought I'd get into this kind of work, but I, you know, it starts out way back when I was eight years old. You know, I had the speech impediment and people would make fun of me. And as I got older, I had to be an actor since I was eight years old. I had to play somebody else in elementary school, junior high school, Franklin High School. I had to play the role because I was embarrassed of who I was because I couldn't speak. That's how I was speaking. And people would make fun of me. And as I got older, I just uh, had to pretend who I, that I was somebody else. And when I pretended, it was like being an actor. So when you're acting, the speech impediment would sometimes fade out. But in real life, I still had the speech impediment. And, and you know, the, the power of pretend is actually pretty strong. In fact, that's the whole premise of my show is that if you pretend to be someone else, you could actually do things that you would never do. And is that the case? I mean, is Fred Brito, the real Fred Brito, is he a con artist at heart? No, um, I've had to do what I had to do just to survive. OK, let's like, come on. In order to survive, I mean, you know, a lot of people have a hard time surviving out there. They just have all the odds against them and they don't break the law and they don't hide their true identity. What do you mean by you had to survive? Well, after you've had a record like mine and been in, in and out of prison, the chances of being hired is very, very slim. Listen, I even applied for bagging jobs at supermarkets legitimately, and they they would do a background check. And so I had to begin the process. Well, no one's going to give me the, a job the right way. So guess what? I have to lie in order to get a job. And if that's what I had to do to survive, then I guess so be it. So what was what was your first con? I, I was in the Marine Corps and I dressed up as a first lieutenant. I didn't, I didn't want to be a second lieutenant. I had to be first. Fred Brito says it was just a Halloween costume. And as I returned back to the base, lo and behold, one of the security guards at the main gate was a person I went to boot camp with and I got busted for, he asked me, how'd you become a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant so fast? We were just in boot camp eight months ago. And I gave him a bunch of BS and he called his superiors. And next thing I know, I'm arrested. That was really my first ever arrest. But this story makes no sense because it's not illegal to dress in military uniform. However, it is illegal to wear a military uniform to commit fraud. Were you discharged from the military? Nope. I got spanked on the wrist and uh, I was a PFC. I got demoted to private and started all over again. After the military, were your plans to kind of go and start a ordinary life or did you well, have, have other plans? I, I, I made a mistake. I was in the military. I'd come home on the weekends. I'd hang out at a bar called The Odyssey. It was the disco era because I was told that that's where all the celebrities would hang out and I would go there. The Odyssey nightclub was an all-age, booze-free nightclub. Now, while this might sound like a clean and safe place to boogie-woogie, trust me, it was not. Angry residents from the surrounding neighborhood say the kids would piss on the wall, do drugs, and have sex outside the nightclub. The Odyssey was also a haven for young gay and lesbian kids. It was a safe place to be whoever they wanted to be. And for a young Fred Brito, the Odyssey was paradise, especially the second floor. So if you ever made it to the second floor, that's where the VIPs were. And I got invited by, by a, a celebrity. His name was Paul Lind. Paul Lind, if you remember, played Uncle Arthur on Bewitched. Gotcha now, Uncle Arthur. <laughs> Forgive me for not rising, but I'm up to my neck and work. And was a regular on Hollywood Square. In what state was Abraham Lincoln born? In what state? Mm -hmm. well, like all of us, naked and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that started the merry-go-round that never ended for like three years. Somehow I created a relationship with him. And I got invited to many of the parties that he was taking me to. I learned to live the life of what celebrities do. And I got myself into some pretty good uh, situations where you were in the middle of a room with all sorts of people that you could only think about. Well, let, let's let's back up a little bit. So the Paul Lynn thing, was that just like a, a friendship? Or was it an acquaintance? Was it romantic? Like what was, what kind of relationship was that? It was, it was a, um, it was a gay relationship. According to Fred Brito, he lived with Paul Lynn for several years, but I have no proof that they ever even knew each other. But that's not the point. Take everything Fred Brito tells you with a grain of salt. As I got older, three years later, I got bumped off for young, younger people, younger guys, and I was left out on the curb. She took away all the credit cards, took away the keys of the car, so I had nothing. And I had to play the role of being the hotshot uh, wheeler and dealer, you know, hanging out with the celebrities, and I couldn't do it. He couldn't do it because Fred Brito was flat out broke and lived with his mom and dad. But he said he had to keep up appearances. When was like the real big first scheme that you that you cooked up? Wow, there's been so many. There's a place years ago it was a place called Budget Rent a Car, and they only rented exotic cars, Excaliburs, Mercedes, you name it. I went out and I rented these cars, and I played the role of being the hotshot person. And I got in trouble doing it because I never returned the car. Or I rented it for like two, I think it was for a weekend. And I had the car maybe two weeks, well well beyond my, my due date. And sure enough, the police were looking for this uh, vehicle. And I, I, I was driving it and got pulled over. And that's how I got busted for Grand Theft Auto. And that Grand Theft Auto charge earned him a felony. Where do you go from there? I uh, did it again. I didn't learn the first time. Rented another car and did the same thing. But you know, the stupid thing is, I had to go to court for my Grand Theft Auto case in Pasadena, California. So here I was, I parked the new rent-a-car that was already late and overdue going back. And as I left court and walked back to my car, sure enough, the LAPD had, had um, uh, I guess they were watching me. And so when I got in the car and I turned it on, Every car from LAPD, Pasadena PD was there too, and they put me on the, on the pavement face down and handcuffed me. So that was two Grand Theft Autos huh. within probably a month. Jeez. What was the goal? Like, what was your, your, your frame of mind back then? I mean, you know, when you're living the, the life of a celebrity or with celebrities, I'm not saying I was a celebrity, but when you're living that life, it is, it is probably the most powerful drug that anybody could ever take because you're addicted to it. You just play the role. Even though I probably had very little money in my pocket, you just play the role. And I was playing the role to the highest hilt that I could. A few months after being discharged from the military, Fred Brito got a job at a bank working as a teller. I got a job at Lloyd's Bank of London, downtown on 8th Street, downtown Los Angeles. And I was short on my rent. So as you turn the till back in, they, you're supposed to account for it. Well, they never really did until the next day. So I took $1,000 in traveler's checks and used that money to play the game of the high roller again. When I came to work the next day after they counted my till, they found that I was $1,000 in traveler's checks short. And they had already uh, called the FBI. And now I had a theft charge from a bank, which is a federal crime. And I was only in there for maybe, I think it was maybe eight months. I got released from that and they sent me out to a halfway house in Hollywood, California. Now, I mean, you have a couple felonies under your belt. I mean, is your next gig under the name Fred Brito? Or is this when you start thinking, hey, you know, maybe I should start going in as, a, as someone else? You bet. I had to. I had no choice. Because, you know, they would do a background check on Fred Brito, and I couldn't use that name. Yeah, so here's the key. I had a social security card. And I had a driver's license, so I had to create aliases that were related to Brito in, in a number of ways. So it's B-R-I-T-T-O, B-R, 
E T T O. So I would have to use different spellings so I could bypass the background check. And let me tell you, back then, technology wasn't what it is today. Back then, if they did a background check on somebody's name and you spelled it incorrectly, it, nothing would come out. So that's how I was able to keep under the radar. Lo and behold, people were gullible back in the 70s and they would believe it. So that was one of the reasons why I was able to slide so many, I mean, we're talking probably 60, 70 jobs in my career that, that I've able to slide through because of misspelling of my ID. And so after the, the bank job, you were appointed to Mayor Tom Bradley's Los Angeles Youth Advisory Council. Yep. Um, but you were asked to resign after three months for misusing the funds. Can you tell me about that? That's a long time ago. Mayor Bradley was, um, he was the most powerful person in downtown Los Angeles. Mayor Bradley served as mayor of Los Angeles for 20 years. That's the longest tenure by any mayor in LA's history. And I'm sure the mayor had seen it all. That is, until he met Fred Brito. Met him a number of times. I was an advocate, or I guess I guess I played the role of an advocate, you know, speaking out for the disenfranchised, speaking out for uh, Latino youth. Fred Brito must have made an impression because he was appointed to the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council. So our, our thing was to gather information and bring it back to the council and the mayor's office to see if the mayor and the council wanted to consider maybe some changes to social services. And... And I thought I was doing a pretty good job there. He was doing a pretty good job, too, until he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. And so because I didn't have authority to spend city money, I had no city credit card. I had no city uh, nothing. Uh, but I would bill it to the city. That's where I ran into a jam. Three months after assuming the role, Brito was asked to resign for mishandling funds. But this was just a game to him. Throughout the 80s, Fred Brito was going into prison with one name and coming out with a brand new identity. I was the office manager for a law firm. And so I was I was their, their, <laughs> their chief administrator for the law firm. And I had access to the company credit card. And I misused the credit card buying uh, things that I probably shouldn't have. Well, they fired me and they filed a report against me with LAPD. LAPD finds out and they call me and I certainly knew what I had done. And next thing I know, I'm on the fastest jet to, to Vancouver. Because I went up there and did the same thing, borrowed somebody else's credit card, used that, got arrested. And I'm in there for six months for, for defrauding an innkeeper and the use of credit cards that weren't where they were not my own. Brito says that the Canadians released him to the U.S. Federal Marshals and the Americans transported him back to L.A. Wow. And, you know, at this point, are you amassing a small fortune from all these crimes or is this just chump change? Chump, chump change. I never really I never really <laughs> I was always broke back in those days. And so that's where having to use other people's credit cards was my was my thing. And so what was that turning point? Because, you know, most people would be like, hey, you know, I keep getting caught. I, I probably should just uh, assume a new identity and like lay low. But I'm assuming that's not what you did. Nope. When we come back, Fred Brito pulls off one of his biggest stunts yet. You have impersonated courtroom psychiatrists, a priest, a Red Cross fundraiser. I mean, tell me about some of the, your biggest schemes. Probably the, well, there's a number of them. I was reading the paper one day and it says the city council of Lancaster, California is looking for city commissioners to volunteer. Every time I've gone out to get whatever kind of a job, I've had to do my studying. I've had to research exactly what I'm going to apply for and know that job inside and out. So I had to I had to work and know the terminologies. I had to know how things are processed. No building could be built in the city of Lancaster without six of us agreeing to it. I was one of six. Wow. Um, so I went to the mayor's office and I sat down in his office and I just gave him I just revealed to him everything I had learned the night before from books that I had collected about 
planning commissions, what planning commissions do, how they do it, why they do it. We're talking about the electrical code, the building code. And he was like, wow, you're the guy I need. And sure enough, within a week, I was appointed. In front of my seat, facing the the audience was my name in gold. Wow, it was a big, one of the thrills of my life. So what was, what were you getting out of it? I, I had the, wow, uh, to be a city commissioner, the doors, the keys to the city were mine. And there was nothing, there was nothing to stop me from any door I wanted to open. Long story short, I blew it because I, my ego got the most of me. So I, I concocted a story. I called Western Union and I created a, 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 a telegram from the White House to me stating that I was being appointed to the position of special counsel on domestic affairs to the president. We're talking President Reagan at that point. That was major mistake. And that was not good because one, I was on parole. My parole officer found out about it. They immediately put me on ice back in LA County jail. And the city had egg on their face because they appointed this felon to be their city commissioner, all because they didn't do a background check. They didn't do any checking. I can only imagine how the late Lancaster mayor, Fred Hahn, felt after he realized he hired a con man. The late mayor told the LA Times, quote, he made us look like fools. Brito told them that he had just moved to town and his wife was killed in a plane crash. Plus, his resume was stellar, the late mayor said. You can't help but like him. He's very personable. But eventually, Fred Brito told too many different lies to too many different people. And after doing a little snooping around, city officials discovered his criminal past and reported Brito to his parole officer. This landed him back in prison for 10 months. For his next con, the details get a little dicey. However, there is one report published in the National Law Journal that describes the story Brito is about to tell. I had a friend of mine who was arrested for possession of marijuana. He, he was going to court. He would call me and he called me on the phone on a, on a collect phone call from LA County Jail and says, I'm in trouble. I got arrested for possession of marijuana. And I said, calm down, calm down. Hold on. What did you do? Well, I, I had marijuana in my pocket and the cops got it and I'm arrested for possession of marijuana. And I said, don't worry about it. We're, what court are you in? Next thing I know, I, I, I'm there the next day for his initial court hearing. It was arraignment. That's what it was. It was arraignment. So I go down there as Dr. Fred Esparza. No, I think it was Mark, Mark Esparza at that time. And so I go down there, briefcase in hand, and uh, the, I, speak, I speak with the public defender who he had. And uh, I said, listen, this is, uh, this is my client. Uh, he has been going through counseling services with me. I played the, a psychiatrist. He's been going through counseling services with me. I, I've been working with him, and I'd like to see if maybe the judge might consider release uh, to my custody, and we would provide every 90 days a report on his progress. And if he stayed clean and no use of marijuana, then the, the charge would be dismissed within 365 days. So we walked over across the hallway to the district attorney, who was the prosecutor. We convinced the prosecutor. I, I told him I was Dr. Mark Gomez or Marcus Barza, whichever name I used at that point. And guess what? They believed everything I told them. They said, we said, we like that idea. We, we think it's a good idea. So uh, when they called his, when they called my friend's case, my friend stood up in the courtroom and the prosecutor is selling this idea to the judge. So they had me stand and I'd come forward and I, and I told the judge, I says, this is my client. He has been going through therapy with me. He, he meets with me once a week, and we've been working through his addictions, yada, yada, yada. I just, I just played it like I was a real physician, and the judge agreed. The judge allowed him to be released on my in, into my custody. Uh, I remember that day I waited for him to be released from jail, and we walked out of the courthouse. I had a briefcase in my hand, and the stupid thing about it was I had a banana in my, my briefcase. If they were to ever ask me for any ID or anything, I had none. I just was, became an actor, and that's what I did. I acted this role, and it worked out perfectly. Were you nervous? Were you laughing? Uh, like uh, I No. Inside, I was a nervous wreck because I was dealing with 
a, a, I mean, a very powerful figure. I mean, this guy was, this judge was like huge and he was the most powerful person in the courthouse uh, in LA County. And did you look the part? Oh yes. I had a suit and tie. I was, I was, I maxed it out and I knew the, the terminologies. I had done my homework. So everything the judge would ask me, I had an answer for, and it was how I spoke that was convincing to the judge I just played the role. I I, I just watched it, uh, interviews of people on the internet who who were lawyers and stuff, and I just acted like them. I became an actor. That's all I can say is I acted my way through this thing, and it worked. And that was not Fred Brito's last acting gig. In fact, his next con, where he pretended to be a priest in order to hide from the law. You have to hear this story. I became Father Fred. And it all started because I was running away from being arrested and I ran to Mexico and who would ever be looking for a priest in Mexico? Plus, a listener of the show calls in and tells me about her run-in with Fred Brito. That's next time on Pretend. Fact-checking for today's episode was by Kate Gallagher. Kate is a listener of the show. She offered to help, and I greatly appreciate it. So if you are out there listening and you want to help this show become a reality, just send me an email, Javier at pretendradio.org, and let's find out how you could help. Also, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters, Nikolai Spencer, Hannah FTW, and Greg Boyer. Thank you so much for supporting this show. My Patreon supporters get pretend t-shirts, stickers, access to early episodes, bonus content. So if you want to support the show and get great stuff, go to pretendradio.org and hit the donate button. I couldn't do this show without you. Also, I want to let you know that in August, I'm going to be at the True Crime Podcast Festival with my co-host from Criminal Conduct, John Taylor. You should definitely, if you're anywhere around Dallas or if you want to just come join us, there's tons of other indie podcasts that are going to be there, like Rebecca Sebastian from Dialogue and, and Charlie from Crime Lines and Josh from True Crime Bullshit. All your your true crime friends are going to be there. So please join us. True Crime Podcast Festival. I have a link in the show notes about it. Oh, and follow me on TikTok. I'm actually trying to post every single day. I'm at Pretend Pod, both on TikTok and Instagram. So go ahead and follow me. I might give away a t-shirt to some random follower. So please follow me on TikTok, Instagram, tag me so that I can know that you heard this. Comment and let me know that you heard the show and I'll enter you into a drawing for a t-shirt. So remember, again, it's Pretend Pod at Pretend Pod on Instagram and TikTok. All right, till next time, more Fred Brito, part two. Boy, this guy. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Creative Babble.